You may proceed. Good morning. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> I am Francis Dibble, and uh, with Mr. Delos Reyes, Gaston Delos Reyes, we represent the defendant appellants, the hospital, the hospital president, and the surgical administrator in this case. This appeal arises from an order of the Superior Court requiring the hospital to produce two sets of documents. One set of documents which the Superior Court judge ruled were not peer review proceedings, reports, or records, and therefore they were not prohibited from discovery and litigation under General Laws Chapter 111, Section 204A. These documents that the judge ruled were not peer review materials consisted of credentialing communications between the defendant hospital and other hospitals. Can you tell me more particularly what that means? Uh, what is a credentialing communication sent to another hospital? Uh, good question, Your Honor. Uh, the, um, essentially uh, what uh, uh, the process is that um, uh, hospitals uh, are required under Massachusetts law and under the law, I believe, of our sister states to communicate with each other when they periodically review credentialing um, applications from physicians. And uh, what happens in practice is Hospital A says we have an application uh, either for renewal of privileges or new privileges or expansion of privileges from Dr. Jones. And um, so Hospital uh, A does, uh, says we are, understand that Dr. Jones is on your medical staff to Hospital B. And Hospital B then provides a required report required by the Board of Registration Medicines to that other hospital. Similar things, uh, similar Okay, things. so that report is sent from hospital B to A, yes. whatever. If I didn't get A and B mixed up, which I Well, I may have gotten A. them mixed up, but whatever. The, the hospital that's requested the information yes. and now received it, yes. that report is under no circumstances available to the doctor being credentialed, right? Uh, as a general proposition, it's a peer review document. I suppose it would depend on the rules in the state where it was to where it was sent if it's an out of state. But under Massachusetts, in general, no. So it's uh, so it's it's well, sort of a reference. I mean, it's just here's how this doctor has done here, or this doctor has been suspended on several occasions for various. Or it conduct, might contain or... evaluative material. It might say, in my opinion, uh, I've reviewed Doctor So and So, and I'm concerned about some issues. So there could be a, a range of material. All right, so that's peer review material, even if it doesn't really grow out of a peer review process. Well, it does because it's the records and reports of a, of a peer review process. It doesn't grow out of a medical peer review committee. Right. It, well, I think what, <clears throat> what, it, what defines it as peer review materials for purposes of Massachusetts statute, Your Honor, is that uh, General Laws uh, Chapter 111, Section 205 in 1987 specifically defined, expanded the definition, 1987, expanded the definition of peer review materials to include all things that are reports, documents generated uh, in compliance with Massachusetts Board of Registration um, uh, requirements. And we detail in our, in our brief those requirements and cite to those well, let's, sections. Let's say Hospital A is requesting this information from Hospital B. There's never been a, a disciplinary problem or a, or a peer review proceeding relating to this doctor. What do they send? Uh, there, well, there's a form, and uh, the form typically uh, includes a request for what, how long the person's been on the staff, what, what mm -hmm. category of staff he's on, what privileges the person has, any disciplinary proceedings, any issues, and a request for information, uh, evaluative information uh, is typically included. So even if there's no peer review process or peer review uh, committee that has done something with respect to this doctor, a report is still sent. A report is still sent. Yes, and the public Your Honor. purpose of that was because there was an understanding, was there not, that hospitals did not want to, Hospital A, on request of information from Hospital B, did not want to say negative things about doctors because hospital, the doctor involved might take offense at that. Exactly so, And so bad doctors were going from one hospital to the other, and the legislature said, no, 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 you must tell us. Correct? Exactly so, Your Honor. And the Massachusetts legislature said that, and, it, and roughly around the same time, the United States Congress said much the same thing in the Health Care uh, 
Quality Improvement Act, uh, which required the, which created the National Practitioner Data Bank, and under many circumstances, reports of disciplinary proceedings and problems are required to be filed also with the federal uh, agency. Well, I assume the doctor knows he's been subject to a disciplinary proceeding and, and the outcome of the proceeding. Yes, sure. But of it's course. not just disciplinary proceedings, am I not, correct? It, not just disciplinary proceedings. Oh, no, it's, it's much, it's, it might be a comment, for example, it might be an inquiry, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, Hospital A is saying, Dr. Jones has requested um, uh, privileges to perform um, cardiac surgery at our hospital, and we understand he's been performing that surgery at your okay. hospital. How has he been doing with it? Has he actually performed cases? How many cases has he performed? Has, has he, he been done it research? without supervision? Has he done it on his own? Exactly so, done? Your Honor. Exactly so. So there could be a whole range of evaluative uh, information okay. um, that might be submitted. The, and again, I, I believe that, that regardless of how we might think about it, the statutes now say in Massachusetts that those are peer review materials. That is, Chapter 204A has been modified by, by 205 to say those are peer review materials. So for that reason, we say that the judge was wrong when he said they when weren't you said there were two materials. categories. Yes, that's you the first You said not peer review but credentialing. You meant... 205. You, you meant... Uh, th those are now, quote, peer review as used yes. in 204, but what yes. you were saying is these were credentialing information, yes. not specifically. Those, that's the category that the judge said were not peer review materials. Okay. And that's, a fir that's the first argument addressed in our, in our brief, and I think I've just uh, summarized our, our position. The second set of, um, of documents which the judge, uh, as to which the judge ordered pro production were materials which I think everyone agrees, the judge agreed, and everyone, uh, the plaintiff agrees, we agree, amicus, uh, two amicus briefs have been filed in this case, agree, are peer review materials, they are proceedings, reports, and records, but the judge ruled that those materials in this case were subject to produ production under the single narrow exception to the prohibition on the disclosure of peer review materials, uh, which is uh, set out in single narrow exception is in General Laws Chapter 204B, and the prohibition is in 204A. And that was the, um, the single narrow exception language comes from this court's uh, decision early this year in the Pardo case. And we say that the judge uh, erred on, on both of those items. <clears throat> the present action was filed uh, in the Superior Court against uh, the, the hospital, the hospital president, and the, the surgical administrator. It originally contained six counts. A judge has dismissed four of the six counts, leaving only claims of defamation against uh, uh, the hospital president and the surgical administrator. The dismissal of several of the claims was based by a Superior Court judge, not the same one who issued the order in this case. Judge, judge Sweeney issued an earlier order dismissing claims because the plaintiff waived his administrative hearing, saying that Dr. V cannot claim that the hospital failed to comply with its bylaws in imposing a suspension when he accepted the criteria for terminating the suspension without requesting a hearing, thereby waiving his right to the hearing offered to him under the bylaws. The court, however, on the motion to dismiss, declined at that stage, merely on a motion to dismiss under 12b-6, declined to dismiss the de two defamation claims, saying that things might be different on a motion for summary judgment, but it's too early for me to dismiss the, the uh, defamation claims on a, on a mere motion to dismiss. That uh, issue, and I, if I have a moment, I'd like to ad address the fact that uh, there are consequences, of course, for waiving an administrative hearing under this court's decision uh, in the O'Brien case and under the appeals court decision in the Berkowitz uh, versus Harvard case that uh, when, a, when a plaintiff waives an internal uh, or doesn't pursue his internal grievance process, he's limited and should be limited in uh, uh, his remedies in court thereafter. In this case, the plaintiff served written discovery requests, um, many of 
which were objected to on the grounds of peer review privilege and motion to compel was filed and we in turn filed a motion for pr protective order. The timing on this is a little bit, I, I think, interesting and may have affected the decision in this case. The oral argument was held on January 11th of this year in front of Judge Agostini. The Pardo decision was issued by this court on January 26th and Judge Agostini issued his order on February 24th, so it was issued after oral argument. I actually sent a copy of the Pardo decision to Judge Agostini on the day that it was issued, but under Superior Court Rule 9, which limits the things that can be filed when a case comes down after uh, oral argument, there's not too much you can say about it unless the judge wants to hear more about it. But he had a copy of that decision. And he issued the order which I referred to earlier, ordering production of the two categories of documents. <coughs> the hospital timely petitioned a single justice to the appeals court for interlocutory review. <clears throat> uh, at the same time, we asked for reconsideration by uh, Judge Agostini in the Superior Court. Uh, and we attached to the motion for reconsideration an affidavit of uh, the hospital president, which had been filed in a prior case between these parties in federal court where the plaintiff had sought an injunction, which was denied. And after the injunction was denied, the plaintiff then dismissed that case and filed the present case. But the, uh, in, the, in the argument before Judge Agostini and in the briefing before Judge Agostini, plaintiff uh, sole argument or, or almost only argument was that the materials were not peer review. That is, there was really no argument and no briefing by the plaintiff at that stage uh, that uh, these materials were subject to exception. There was a brief reference to that in the brief. There were no affidavits filed. There were no discovery materials filed before Judge Agostini. Judge Agostini denied our motion for reconsideration. Uh, and as I said, the an appeals court single justice granted the petition in this court subsequently granted plaintiff's request for direct appellate review. Are the, you suggesting, Mr. Dibble, that we don't have, that, that the record before this court is not sufficient for us to decide your issues? Oh, uh, the record is sufficient to decide uh, the issue, Your Honor. Because that affidavit is part of the record? That affidavit is part of the record okay. now. It's part of the record in this court. The, uh, the, the, uh, uh, and I think the nature of the allegations in this case make clear that there, there, were, there was not a sufficient showing under, under Pardo, uh, even if the allegations were uh, simply the allegations don't get anywhere near the Pardo uh, standard in this instance. The um, facts, the incident in question in this case, as reflected in the, in the affidavit of the hospital president, president all the facts involving this incident and the summary suspension took place over about 36 hours. That is, there was an incident, there was an inquiry over a day or a day and a half, and the suspension was issued. And as I'll uh, note, there was subsequently, a, within three subsequent business days, a summary suspension review committee which modified and recommended termination of the suspension. But the issue of how quickly summary suspension naturally takes place uh, is uh, relevant to the findings that the judge made in this case. The incident uh, involved uh, uh, a report to the hospital president that the plaintiff, a surgeon, had attended a meeting at seven, uh, early in the morning of October 28, 2004, uh, with the surgical administrator and a nurse administrator, a, a woman, and with the chief of anesthesia. The re initial report to the hospital president was that the plaintiff had engaged in physically threatening behavior, including shouting uh, at uh, the, re the, re the reporter, the surgical administrator, inches from his face, using his body to block his exit from the conference room, slamming a heavy stack of papers down on the table, and picking up and throwing a chair across the room. The hospital president found the complainant administrator terribly upset and fearful. About an hour later, uh, the hospital president met with the, the nurse, the woman nurse who had also been in the meeting, who described the incident. She began to tremble and cry <coughs> as she reported to the hospital administrator, excuse me, to the hospital president. She appeared frightened, reported how she had cowered in the corner as the plaintiff was enraged and slamming papers on the table. Later that day, the hospital president had members of his staff meet with the uh, 
uh, surgical administrator and the, and the nurse to assess their concerns. Uh, and several people did uh, meet with, with them and provided memoranda to the hospital president, each describing the fear for their physical safety, which they characterized, and the demeanor and fear which they experienced. The medical staff bylaws of the hospital in this case empower the chief executive officer, which the hospital president is, to issue a summary suspension for various reasons, including reducing the substantial likelihood of uh, injury or damage to the... That, that issue is not an issue which is before us, though, correct? All we're looking at is the discovery. We're looking at the discovery issue, but the judge in this case uh, found uh, that his basis and his basis for issuing the order to compel was that there was uh, that in essence that the summary suspension should not have been issued on the investigation that took place that the investigation was too short too limited uh, that there were there were um, and there's a disputed allegation that the plaintiff has in his complaint that the judge found as a fact without any affidavit that was just no, no and, but, but that's not the issue that we're considering is it well the issue is is that the judge in this case um, made a, a, a finding which we say under Pardo had really two deficiencies in, in substance. okay so you're saying that that unless we examine that finding we can't reach whether or not the Correct, Your Honor. I, I think the, the, the two deficiencies in the judge's... Mr. Dibble, I'm, I'm just watching the flashing lights. I, I, so I know I'm in trouble here, Your Honor. You are in trouble. Uh, but what are the, just quickly, the two, the, the the two three, deficiencies are the ones that you've identified. Three issues. Two of them, the deficiencies in the judge's findings, are that the quality of the showing required by Pardo was deficient. That is the quality. There were no affidavits. There were no discovery materials. The judge relied solely on allegations from the plaintiff, almost all of which were disputed and uh, challenged in the answer of the defendants and which are challenged specifically in the affidavit of the hospital president. He made unwarranted or speculative uh, inferences. Those, uh, that's the quality of the evidence. Second, the substance, the content of the showing was deficient under Pardo because the judge focused on the motive of the hospital president. Although the judge cited Pardo, he didn't follow Pardo. He focused on the motive, the, that is the reasons which Pardo expressly says are, is not the basis on which a, 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 uh, um, uh, an order to uh, uh, find a uh, breach, to, to, to breach the, uh, or to create the, sing, fall into the single narrow exception to non-disclosure. The, uh, uh, and the third thing is the judge makes a, a, a broad error of law uh, and uh, and that is that he uses a sort of estoppel argument to say, well, hospital, if you want to assert that these documents are subject to the peer review material, then they are actions by a committee member within the scope of his committee responsibilities, which just is not so. And the reason for that is the definition of peer review materials is broader than the definition of actions of a committee member within the scope of his committee responsibilities. Uh, and that's because of the nature of committee responsibilities. And I think this all relates uh, back to the fact that the plaintiff waived his internal remedy. And I would point out, as does the Mass Hospital Association in its brief, had the plaintiff exercised his rights to an appeal under the hospital staff bylaws, he would have received in that proceeding all of the records which he now seeks because the prohibition on disclosure of records that's contained in 204A does not apply in internal hospital proceedings. Mr. Dibble, I'm going to have to ask you to end there. I do have one question which I'll ask you and Mr. Melligan. Th this um, <clears throat> case comes to us as an impounded case. Can you yes, tell me the circumstances in which it was impounded? What are the circumstances? Yes. Your Honor, it was impounded in the Superior Court. On whose motion? Uh, on, on our motion. I. Th uh, there have been a number of motions to impound, and I believe in this particular one we may have agreed on, on impoundment. Uh, did the judge the, follow the impoundment rules? Did excuse me, Your Honor? Did the was this just an agreement which was not? It was an agreement. Uh, I believe it was an agreement. It was a motion. I believe it satisfied the impoundment rule. I believe we cited the impoundment rule. And the, um, uh, and the grounds, in essence, are that by statute, <coughs> everything about this matter is precluded from discovery or admission in evidence 
by statute, uh, and it and it would disclose material which, um, by law, is not to be disclosed. I would ask that, although it may not be an issue here, that the mater that the motion and supporting materials be sent as uh, up on the impoundment question. We will, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Dibble. Mr. Thank Milligan. Good Mr. morning, Your Honor. You have 15 minutes, but I'll let you respond. Thank you very much. Uh, I would submit to the court that the case before the court uh, this morning is a very interesting one and a very important one. It comes following the decision of this court approximately a year ago in the Pardo case. Uh, the Pardo case was something that was not yet decided at the time we argued the case, but it was a case that was decided well before the judge reached his decision in this case. And the judge uh, considered and applied Pardo in his memorandum of decision granting our motion to compel discovery. And I, I would suggest to the court that Judge uh, Agassini was well aware of the requirement of uh, there being a threshold showing in, uh, in the material submitted to him uh, in, in deciding to order the discovery. He took the responsibilities very seriously. He ruled against us on the issue of whether or not this was peer review at all, and we haven't, we've accepted that ruling and we've not appealed it. What Judge Agostini did was he concluded that there were two things, undisputed facts that he felt using the collective weight of the evidence satisfied in the exercise of his discretion uh, that the part of threshold show, showing had been met. Uh, I think which, which, which undisputed facts were those? Well, I, I can recite some to you, okay. Your Honor, if and I might. And how were they, in what form were yeah, they? Yeah, where do they come mm -hmm. from? I mean, what we're hearing from Mr. Dibble's side is it all you relied on was the facts in an unverified, set forth in an unverified complaint, no affidavits, no depositions, no well, nothing else. Again, on motion for reconsideration, we did submit an affidavit, as did, did the, uh, uh, the defendant. But at the time of the hearing, uh, there were affidavits, there were representations of counsel, and there were a number of issues that just were not contested. And I might go through them if, if I will, because the judge did rely on these undisputed issues. It was undisputed that the hospital president waited for 32 hours before invoking summary suspension following the argument. It was undisputed that under the Franklin Medical Center bylaws that summary suspension was reserved for emergencies. Mr. It was Mr. Mary, can I just interrupt you, though? What, what do we, because your brief lays out the undisputed facts, and I take it that each of those is somewhere in an affidavit. They're not. Okay. Leaving that aside, how do you respond, I mean, I believe you believe, how do you respond to the claim that had this been channeled internally, there's a process for channel, challenge, challenging this internally for the doctor, and that if you don't do that and choose to go outside, it's not, it's not a strict waiver issue, but there's one thing that the legislature has established as a way for you to get access well, to those It's records. the first time I've ever heard that there would have been access to these materials internally. Well, leaving, leaving aside whether they would or wouldn't have been, but if I look at um, 204, I mean, 204 is narrow, but it essentially assumes that you're going to go internally, doesn't it? Well, when, when the issue of the internal uh, uh, review came up, uh, we wrote a letter to the hospital board of trustees, and we said we do very much want to use an internal review process, but there are a number of things about the way the Franklin Medical Center internal review process uh, is set up that were problematic. Number one, using the internal review process contains with it an automatic waiver of any claims you might have against any hospital personnel for anything whatsoever, and it also constitutes a, a, an immunity, a grant of immunity by the person electing the internal process. And then those are in the bylaws. And then the bylaws specifically say if you elect internal administrative review, you reaffirm the immunity and releases that we have provided in the bylaws. So we wrote to the, the uh, Board of Trustees and we said these are un inherently unfair. It's, 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 it's an unconscionable position to put my client in that he has to waive any immunity and, any re and grant a release to the uh, hospital or hospital personnel for anything that he might Did want to see. Did your client at that point go to the Superior Court and say, look, I don't want to go through the inter interior because I'm being asked to waive defenses and I think that that's, um, you know, unconscionable? Well, we didn't at that point. 
but we did raise it when it came up later in the proceedings. We did say to the hospital president, in addition, uh, or to the trustees, in addition, the internal review process is one that is governed exclusively by uh, Mr. Skinner, who is the person that was the uh, sort of protagonist in this situation. He had the ability uh, to uh, set up the internal review committee. He was able to be a member of the internal review committee. Uh, the hospital bylaws also said that the internal review committee uh, doesn't necessarily even uh, have to follow uh, any recommendations that are made to it by anybody. That once the internal review committee makes a decision, the trustees can, for no reason at all, at a meeting that Mr. Dr. Reynos was not able to attend, can reverse anything that goes on on the internal review process. So it was an entirely illusory process. And we wrote a very elaborate letter, and it's in the record, to the chairman of the Board of Trustees saying, one, the releases, the immunity, and the fact that we can go through this process, and in the end, the trustees can reverse anything that happens below. We don't get to participate in that hearing. We don't get to be heard at that hearing. Uh, so it means nothing in order to go through that process. And so we asked him to set up a fair and impartial ad hoc internal review grievance procedure whereby it was free of the influence of Mr. Skinner, who was the uh, antagonist. Let me, let me tell you what, what, what underlies my concern, and maybe you can help me address it, uh, you know, in a way which protects your clients, seems to me quite legitimate concerns. Um, the legislature has told us in absolutely no uncertain terms in a manner that is consistent with federal law that there is something terribly important about making sure that there be open communications, not only between uh, within a particular medical uh, institution, but across medical institutions. And so, so that, is, and so we have, I think, in part, on, as consistent with other cases, tended to say you've got to look at it very strictly. Then we have a, a, a body of law that says once you go into court. These are open proceedings, hence my question about impoundment. <laughs> and if you don't elect to go internally with all the mechanisms that you can, reserving your right to challenge, reserving your right to challenge, reserving your right to challenge, I don't think that you can solve the problem by coming into a, into a public court and then just agreeing that it will all be impounded. And so it may be that... Um, you, you have to help me through that. I guess, well, what happened with the, with the impoundment was, again, that, that again, was... Again, not going to the merits of it, but you, understand, you said, I don't like that proceeding, so I'm going to go to a public proceeding, and then I recognize that there are some problems here because all of this is confidential, and so what I'm going to do is impound it, and that seems to me that we can't proceed on that basis. And, and it, it wasn't, it wasn't a, the impoundment to the extent that the case seems to have arrived here impounded. Uh, Attorney Vanessa Smith for the defendants wanted the case impounded. I agreed to have the case impounded with her because at that point my client uh, was, again, trying to establish a new medical practice. These were pretty significant allegations. And, uh, but I, we did have an agreement in a letter, and it's probably not in the record, that I said to her, the impoundment is for this purpose only, and she agreed with this, that the public may not come in and inspect the record. Uh, but that nothing else about this will be impounded to the extent that if the press picks up on this dispute, as it might well have, that I am not in any way bound to uh, refrain from communicating with the press or anybody in the public, so that it was a, a very limited kind of an impoundment order, and it was meant to accommodate the needs of the parties at that time. At this point in time, uh, I don't see any actual need for the impoundment. When we got here to the SJC, there was a lot of, of, of effort on the behalf of the defendants to try and impound the caption of the case, which it never was before. It doesn't make any sense to me that the case is now before you on an impounded caption. Uh, and I would suggest to the court that the impoundment uh, purposes have long since, I think, become superseded by uh, the way in which this case has evolved in the court. Well, let, let me go back no. to this. So now these do documents are ordered, handed over. And I'm not just thinking about this case, because what we say here, and what that says to me is that if a plaintiff, uh, if a physician, disagrees, perhaps for legitimate reasons, but not for, or for not legitimate reasons, that, that the internal processes, and I assume that he had access to the, he or she had access to the Articles of Incorporation and everything else before he or she elected to join the staff, um, says, I don't like them for whatever reason, can then go into court, can then go into court, and then all of the public purpose protections 
about the, the confidentiality of the back and forth about the qualifications and qualities and level of service and everything else that is going on in hospitals becomes part of a public record. That, that's my concern. Um, I mean, so why would we not say, no, you have to go through internal proceedings and challenge them all the way? Well, because you... internal proceedings are an end in and of themselves. The internal proceedings give us no opportunity to address a slander issue. The only thing that the internal proceedings gave us an opportunity to do was try and reverse a summary suspension. But, but, once if, the it... but if the slander issue is encompassed within what doctors say about each other, or supervisors say, or one hospital says to another, that was precisely the concern, precisely the concern that doctors and hospitals had about being frank about the um, professional competence. Except in a situation where the requirements of 85N, 231-85N, are established yeah. where there is a, a showing that there has been an absence of good faith and an absence of a, a, a reasonable basis to believe the action at issue was warranted. And in this particular situation, we have a situation where for 32 hours, Dr. Vrenos was permitted to perform surgeries at the hospital. He was permitted to do rounds. He was permitted to uh, 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 be on call. And during that period of time, uh, the hospital president never once asked Dr. Vrenos what happened at his version, got asked his version of the argument that it happened 34, 36 hours before. Could, never. could I ask for a simple clarification? Because I think sure. something was making it very difficult for me to understand the arguments in this case. Um, what are the documents that we are talking about that stem from that period of the investigation? Because I see the statute has an exception for things that are original source materials. Some of this would seem to me to be potentially original source materials. But I, I have a hard time understanding what are the documents that you are looking for that they are withholding? Everything we ask for, they are withholding on the grounds of peer review, peer review privilege with no discernment on their part that they were original source materials. Did, we you, want did, you, did you file a motion to, to, you know, I mean, I've done lots of litigation. You get a privilege and you say, give me the privilege log. I want to know the data was prepared. That's not protected. That's protected, <coughs> not protected. Who prepared it? The, the only, no, we did not get a privilege log in this particular case. Again, they did told us. Did you ask us, for one? Well, we, we attempted to get one, and it was told to us that that's peer review privilege as well. And, and the only way we actually got some inkling of what they contemplated is they filed ex parte something with the court that the court apparently did not believe belonged in an in a impoundment file and put into the appendix of the case, put into the, I filed it. It's now in our, in our record appendix. Only then did I actually find out some of the documents that they were actually working with. They would not share with us anything. What we're actually looking for are the, the documents that were generated from 7.30 in the morning on Thursday to 3.30 in the afternoon on Friday, the period of time during which uh, Mr. Skinner was involved in preparing the summary suspension in terms of what the incident reports were, what the claims were. Uh, during that period of time, they also went out and, and, and generated two com employee complaints against Dr. Vrenos that actually well predated this October 28th incident. We have no idea what those are. We have no idea what they're about. Uh, and they say that he had a history of unprofessional and disruptive conduct and that he was perceived at Franklin Medical Center to be abusive, intimidating, hostile, and physically threatening. We're asking for what it is that they rely on in order to make those assertions and those allegations in the notice of summary suspension. All we're really looking for are documents related to the episode, the incident, and Dr. Vrenos's history at the hospital on which they rely in making this allegation. In order allegation. to establish a claim of defamation. Exactly. Well, that, that, I have to say, causes me some concerns. And these are all the things that, in other words, generated prior to the actual issuance of the summary suspension letter. Right. 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 But, but not necessarily created later during the later proceedings. Right. Basis. They, 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 were, they were generated from the moment of the argument on Thursday morning in the next 36 hours up to the time of the summary suspension. And that is You're classic, saying. classic peer review. I want to know what was said at the time. And, I, and the legislature, state and federal, has said, we're going to protect people. Isn't that what they've said? They said that unless in 
B, and in 85N, somebody can demonstrate a lack of good faith and a reasonable basis to believe that the actions are warranted. And when you wait for 32 hours, you don't ask somebody who was involved in the argument, Dr. Vranos or Dr. Godek, the only objective witness, what happened. This, you allow that person to perform five surgeries. You've said that to me, Mr. Milligan, and again, my, the, the different levels that a hospital might have, and maybe that is sufficient, but one of them is that somebody loses their temper. Well, if you take, you know, as opposed to somebody who obviously doesn't understand, you know, what the level of drugs should be. In other words, losing one's temper may not be that you were boiling point all of the time. I mean, take it that was essentially what was underlying. It was this an thing. argument, yes. Yeah. But, but, Your Honor, again, trying to address what you're concerned about with why the internal process, there's, there's no indication to me that the materials that we would have requested, uh, that our peer review we would have ever gotten in the course of this internal review. I think that is something that has been presented here for the first time. It comes out of some amicus brief that I've never seen and never heard about until today. And I submit to the court that that has absolutely nothing to do with an independent cause of action for slander when the prerequisites of what the legislature intended. The legislature intended a strong privilege. They did not intend a, an absolute privilege. It's not as if we're talking about a 233-20J privilege, which is an absolute privilege. They intended a strong privilege with some very specific exceptions. We have a situation where there was an abundant amount of material and factors for the trial court judge to consider in concluding that there, based on undisputed issues, was a sufficient showing that the, the uh, hospital had acted without good faith and without a reasonable basis to believe that their actions were warranted, so as to allow us to trigger that narrow exception. Mr. Milligan, let me ask you this. Do, do you disagree with Mr. Dibble um, that we can decide this under 205, not 204? that in fact there's a confidentiality provision under 205 and that 205 appears to be broader than 204? <coughs> I mean, you keep saying 204 and 85N, and I just wonder whether you mean 204 slash 205 or whether you really mean 204 or 205. In well, other words, if I'm under 205, if the, if the material is under 205, so it's not classic committee material. Some of the material, yes. So, right, right, yes. Isn't that material nevertheless confidential under 205? Yes, because it refers back to 204. 204. Correct. So. But 204 also creates an exception to no, all I of understand. it for, for the same cognate provision as found in 85N. Okay. So that the, so it is your view that the confidentiality language of 204, well, because of the, I see what it's, okay because it goes back to 204. It does. The, the legislature has used so, so you're not saying that the material is 204. You're saying that the, the exception, whatever information is covered by 205, is subject to the 204 exception. We are. Okay. We are. And, and we're also saying <coughs> that, that to the extent that 203 is a little bit broader even in terms of its immunity, that you have to read the, what, what uh, is uh, – read there with respect to the exceptions as well. Once you decide to breach the immunity from damages, you also match the immunity from damages with the immunity from discovery. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mellion. Thank you. All right.